Oh, I forget to ask, uh, do you want to record the webinar? Um, yes, Eric, uh, so uh, we have a, a policy of, uh, of recording the seminars and then posting them live, but you can always choose whether yes or not. That's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot. So people are coming in. Good. Right. Oh no. Okay, <laughs> oh no. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I'm trying to collapse the screen. Oh, there it is. It's up there. Yeah. You try to what? I was the, the panel where your faces are, so I could see my slides. Okay. I, I did it. It's all good. So, so I, th I think we are, I think probably we can start. Um, um, thank you uh, everyone but for attending this uh, first um, um, seminar under the, the new lockdown. Um, we have, uh, today we'll be speaking the, about um, Burley Ulcer with Eric Bembo for the Michigan State University. Um, uh, so we has been invited by Christine Chevillon. And, uh, um, so if you want as, uh, as usual, uh, please uh, ask your questions in the questions and answer um, uh, panel on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and then we will read them aloud and see uh, uh, well, for for the discussion at the end of the of the talk. So, if you want, uh, Christine, uh, I don't, um, uh, to introduce uh, Eric Bembo, and then we can then go with the seminar. Um, good. Thank, thanks a lot. Okay, so um, I would just uh, first uh, thank the SEM organizer, but also the LABEX SEMEB. Uh, so Eric should have been with us in October and November in Montpellier. 
uh, invited by the LabExamab. Was, uh, the coronavirus just disturbed a bit these things, and I hope that uh, Eric could come, will be able to come uh, next year in October and November, and so meet people in Montpellier interested in uh, in in his uh, in his work and uh, in talking about disease emergence or micro insect microbe uh, interaction. So. Uh, to present Eric, I would say as a community ecologist with a strong interest in aquatic ecological network, insect microbe interaction, uh, but also on the ecological importance of dead animals in shaping ecological community through the, the energetic resources they are providing. Uh, he passed his PhD at Dayton University in Ohio on the question of fluctuating stability in stochastic environment using as biological model uh, Hawaiian keramid species. And just after two postdoc, he was recruited in uh, Michigan State University, where he's now appointed in, uh, in two departments, as you can say in the first slide. And, uh, and along this, 15 past years, it has developed uh, long-term research uh, on different, different problematics uh, on forensic, on insect microbe interaction. And, uh, and on the topic, it will talk today, um, uh, which is really where the central question is how uh, environmental perturbation and perturbation of ecological network can result in an emerging disease. Okay, please, Eric, just. Uh... Okay, well, thank you very much, Christine, and thank you uh, from LabX for the invitation. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be there. Um, we were look really looking forward to that. That was supposed to be a six month sabbatical um, in, in France and in other places of Europe, which has been postponed. Also, forgive me, I've been a little bit distracted over the last few days. We have a little election that um, I've been paying attention to and it, and it keeps changing by the minute. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to focus today on some work that uh, goes with the micro uh, insect interaction premise of the lab uh, that I run. And we do that in a couple of different systems, but the one I'm gonna talk about today is really about uh, how a, a disease called Borrelia ulcer um, may emerge or, or, or become epidemics in human populations. And we're, we're not sure how people get it, but we're starting to take a different approach of trying to basically understand the, the evolution and the ecology of, of the primary pathogen um, with some other congeners that, that harbor a plasmid that, that uh, codes for a toxin that's ultimately, and perhaps coincidentally, um, affects humans in, in some way. So I'm gonna take you through that, that kind of story of um, where we came from and, and at least where I've come from with this and where we're going as a collaborative group. Uh, so the, a lot of the work that I'm talking, gonna talk about today is in high, high collaboration with uh, experts in microbiology, mathematical modeling, um, and uh, evolution. But I started out as an aquatic entomologist in, in streams and in tropical streams of Hawaii, really, and, and moved into other tropical areas. And I spent a lot of time underwater, um, really snorkeling, evaluating um, aquatic habitats from the perspective of a fish um, in many ways. And so I started looking at aquatic ecosystems in the, the microbial communities and the insect communities and how they started to resemble in many ways how forest ecosystems are constructed, but in a different aqueous medium, of course, and, and how succession plays different roles in biofilm and how that broader, that ecosystem, that micro ecosystem um, is impacted by larger scale phenomena, um, perhaps like land use change. But also within that are insects that like these uh, caddisflies that are grazers, shredders, predators of microorganisms um, and biofilms 
in some of these ecosystems. And so that's, that's where I get my perspective. And what I've been looking at is how those aquatic insects and how those microbial communities interact in ways that um, are important for ecosystems and particularly disease ecology. And so this is the way I, I often look at um, these ecosystems. Um, fish here is the primary target of, of the visual here, but really I wanna explore what goes on in these biofilm communities and these microbial communities on surfaces and then how it interacts with uh, benthic invertebrates. And in the case of this seminar, we're gonna be talking about how these invertebrates in these microbial communities might lead to uh, transmission to humans and other wildlife for disease pathogenesis. If you look within that microbial biofilm, it is much more complex than we ever thought with confocal microscopy and other uh, new technologies and high throughput sequencing. Now we're beginning to really understand the diversity of the microorganisms and the molecules that they secrete and how they interact through competition, predation, uh, competitive exclusion and, and things like that. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today because that's where a lot of my interest originated about fifth, uh, 15 years ago with regard to Beruli ulcer. And to understand that the, the microbial communities in aquatic habitats, um, I had a PhD student a few years ago who was interested in um, looking at how abiotic and biotic uh, factors affect community assembly, uh, assembly using high throughput sequencing techniques. And she was wondering whether epilithic biofilm succession, the, the communities of that, uh, interacted with invertebrate uh, grazing, and if certain communities affected the behavior of the invertebrates. And so this is, this is what we came up with. Um, a quick study of, of looking at um, assembly and in situ biofilms created uh, these biofilm tiles on these bricks. They were adhered, and then they were placed on this larger board. And then we had uh, four different conditions. One, just ambient control. Two, we modified the flow by putting screws here to create turbulence. And then we put this setup with modified flow under a, a dark canopy, reduced and attenuated light. And then we just had dark conditions, meaning it was the ambient control with dark conditions. And so that was the question of how do abiotic conditions of sunlight and flow affect steam bi stream biofilm communities? They were placed in a, a factorial design and a randomized block design in these stream systems. And it kind of looked like this in a heavily modified um, agriculturally impacted stream in Ohio. This was the overall study design. You had your, your treatments here. There was, um, we allowed those um, tiles to grow biofilm on them for over 28 days. And then some of them were analyzed uh, immediately for uh, biomass and algal productivity, but also for the communities using high throughput sequencing. And then she took some of these tiles and put them into these grazing experiments where we allowed a snail and a mayfly independently to preferentially graze among those tiles. And then we also did a um, combination of snails and mayflies that represented the density in those streams. So basically they had their choice of 64 unique biofilms that represented this succession of, um, over time, the succession of the biofilms from seven to 28 days under ambient modified flow, dark and modified do uh, dark conditions. And you can see here, uh, there were, Darkness had a huge impact, especially on algal biomass and production. Um, and if you allowed light, you couldn't really see it here, but there's a slight difference in biomass that occurred in the modified flow compared to the ambient. And if you look at that in terms of mean biomass as milligrams per square centimeter, the, the major effect occurred, uh, and I'm supposed to have something in there, um, at about 21 days, so dark and modified flow were really reduced into both total and algal biomass, but then you get ambient and modified flow um, that increased over time, and really around 21 days is where you got an effect of the modified flow, where there was uh, more both uh, total um, biomass and algal biomass. So the ambient, the abiotic conditions were having an effect on community, uh, uh, on the community dynamics going on here. Then when we put those into the grazing experiment, what we found was at that 21 days, there was preferential grading 
in terms of the change of chlorophyll A, the uh, change in ash-free dry mass from the control, where there were significant reductions at 21 days for both the, in the modified flow and in the ambient conditions. And what this suggests is that the mayflies uh, and snails preferentially were grazing certain uh, biofilm communities, certain microbial communities, after they had achieved 21 days of succession. Um, there's some questions about what leads to climax in these communities, et cetera. And some of the, the data here suggests that it, it starts to level off uh, at 28 days. And so if you looked at the communities using ERISA at the time, um, what you could see was both in bacterial communities and eukaryotic communities, there was a significant effect of um, the, from, from no grazing, which was none, compared to the communities that were ultimately grazed. Um, if you just look at this as grazing pressure, zero grazers, one species versus two species, you can see that there's significant clustering uh, among the grazing pressures. And so these data suggest that the grazing pressure does have a significant effect on the microbial communities in these systems. And then you can go in and look at the different taxa and identify indicator taxa, which we've done, but I, I won't get into today. But the overall uh, premise here is the aquatic microbial communities are dynamic. We've, all, we've known that, but high throughput sequencing is allowing us to know who is actually starting to change over time during that succession. They respond to abiotic and biotic conditions, much like most communities. Um, they affect eukaryotic behavior or foraging, and the communities themselves are affected by invertebrate feeding. So what this means is that these communities are highly dynamic, and the microbes have an effect on eukaryotes, and the eukaryotes have an effect on the microbes. And so I started thinking about this more from pathogens. What if a pathogen is part of that community? Um, and from an invasive species question, do certain communities hold the pathogen in, in check, meaning keeps the pathogen numbers pretty low most of the time? And does it take a disturbance to affect the community, maybe grazing by an invertebrate in this case, that allows the pathogen to be released to use its, um, its, its suite of uh, traits to become more abundant in, in the community. And so that's how it gets, relates to infectious disease. And if you think about the classic example of the uh, accidental, in some ways, um, discovery of penicillin, it was really penicillin having this negative effect on microbes in a Petri dish. And then they ran a few other question, uh, a few other experiments and identified that it, it was an effect, but um, why? would it have this effect on bacteria? And is a larger question. And that gets into some of the earlier writings by Gold and uh, Lewontin, uh, talking about how we might wanna distinguish between the current utility or how we perceive the utility compared to the reasons of the origin. And so that's the, the premise of, of where we're going with some of our recent work with Bruley ulcer. And taking this one health approach uh, where we want to evaluate the environmental health, animal health, and human health and where they interact. And while a lot of this that I'm talking about is environmental health because of the way that um, microbial and insect communities and aquatic communities themselves are affected by landscape change and other perturbations on those ecosystems. So thinking about it from um, a, a health environment network within the larger socioeconomic context. Um, I won't talk about these, these other parts, but I wanna focus on these environmental dynamics because that's where the key interest I've always had is from a community ecology perspective is what are those abiotic and biotic effects and how that might lead to the release of pathogens or the release of uh, vectors in certain circumstances and allows for a pathogen to not only persist in an environment, but disperse and be transmitted. If you think about that in many ways, it, it, it sounds a lot like a biological invasion, especially um, if you have a new microbe or a new taxa that gets into a new environment or a new microbial community, what's the effects or how does it interact with some of those other species? And what we know from uh, invasion ecology is that Disturbed ecosystems uh, and introduced species become established and they're kind of related. Um, 
the introduced species often can affect parasite dynamics and the native host communities and populations. There's multiple mechanisms throughout the literature addressing this at both local and global scales. And that we, we're beginning to see that the community scale is, is of importance, especially when you start looking at mechanisms by which some of these uh, changes take place when a new species gets into a naive habitat. In 2004, uh, Calloway Ridner uh, developed this novel weapons hypothesis, mostly uh, developed for um, terrestrial pl invasive plant species, where they considered that uh, invader or introduced plant species had new weapons or novel weapons that really were really important for becoming highly competitive in naive communities. That the introduced species evolved in their native habitats and ecosystems, and the weapons were often in the form of biomolecules or chemicals that affected or negatively affected uh, potential competitors in that new habitat. And it gave it an advantage. And so we've been thinking a lot about how this novel weapon hypothesis might be employed for looking at how microbes and bacteria and fungi um, get into a new habitat or simply respond to changing abiotic or biotic conditions in a way that allows them to disperse and move and colonize and take over certain areas. But couple that with the coincidental virulence hypothesis that is, is somewhat arguable and is contentious, but it, it, the premise there is that some environmental microbial species, they possess these traits that evolve for very different reasons in natural habitat, but coincidentally can be used to both colonize and cause pathogenesis in a vertebrate host or I guess an invertebrate host too. Um, and that selection really occurs outside of the host, but you have these traits that provide it, um, that allow the pathogen to exploit a new niche. And there's lots of examples of opportunistic parasites that occupy multiple environments. But from a more of a One Health concept, we're starting to really understand that, and, and if you take this from a human context, um, there's, there's a lot of biological microbial interactions happening in, in, the human, um, in the human context. And the Human Microbiome Project really, and, and through medicine, we're, we're beginning to understand that your medical treatment effects, for instance, antibiotics can affect the microbial community dynamics in a way that allows for um, changes such as yeast infections, for instance, on the, on the skin. And in skin communities, now that with new technologies, we're beginning to understand that they're pretty complex. You have bacteria, viruses, fungi, mites, that when this community is disrupted, it can often lead to certain things like um, psoriasis and eczema and other derm, uh, dermatological ailments. And so there's precedent both in, in the medical field too, that when you disrupt microbial communities or you change the microbial communities of a host, it also, can or potentially can lead to um, either pathogen or parasite uh, takeover. So what's in the literature? Um, there's some support for the novel weapons in invasive plant species. Others have found no evidence for this, but they do recognize this biochemical recognition hypothesis, meaning um, that certain microbial species are uh, producing chemicals that are sensed by other organisms and that they react accordingly to that bio biochemical recognition. So maybe they're not necessarily weapons. Maybe they're just traits that have functional importance for the, the individual microbe. Um, we do that my, microbial interactions trigger the production of antibiotics in a variety of contexts. And uh, this paper advocates that Maybe we're in a new era of identifying new molecules that have human health importance because we're getting away from monocultures, meaning if you grow uh, potential pathogens or other mi microbes just by themselves, they don't interact with others. And so the molecules that they produce are very different if they're monoculture versus co-culture versus complex culture. And so they're arguing that these complex microbial communities don't always produce certain molecules unless they're interacting with other species in their habitat, much like the biofilms that I showed you earlier, as, and we hypothesize some of those interactions are ongoing. And then what I, what I pose here is maybe we're not talking about weapons all the time, 
although I'll keep using that term, maybe it's just microbial novel traits that certain microbes have that allow them to um, enter, colonize, and persist in new communities. So what is, what's the overall framework here? Um, from a large scale, we're looking at interactions between ecosystems, communities within those ecosystems, how dis disturbance affects these, um, uh, these dynamics and perhaps allows for invasions of new microbes or vertebrates or invertebrates. But ultimately these interactions have community level um, dynamics that might allow for the expression of um, novel traits and in, with the right hosts that are nearby and interacting with that environment, perhaps it leads to virulence and pathogenesis, such as brutally ulcer disease. But also in the meantime, perhaps we can find and identify and discover new novel benefits that's related to the interactions of these communities um, that we can start to think about that maybe they evolved in one environment, but they're employed for survival in a new environment. And maybe that's a human host. So going back to that complex community, this is where some of our interests are going as a collaborative group. And we're gonna add uh, how the micro or how the macro invertebrates um, affect these dynamics and interact with, with some of uh, these communities and potential pathogens in these communities. And we're doing that within the context of Brule ulcer or Mycobacterium ulcerans infection that I've been studying now for about 17 years. It's a um, skin disease that doesn't necessarily kill, but it increase, has huge morbidity, especially in developing nations of West Africa, um, where it's most highly endemic. So it's found throughout the world from New Mexico, French Guiana, some parts of South America, Australia, Indonesia, China. Um, but if you start to look more focally at where it's distributed, um, it's only in a few places in Australia, for instance, only in a few places, at least it's been discovered in, in Asia. Um, it's probably much more widespread in natural environments um, in tropical areas of the world, but there are, isn't a lot of contact with potential human hosts. And so that's another question with Brule ulcer. So we're kind of restricted to where we can go where humans are uh, interacting with the environment to explore the disease. But if you're, if you're studying just the ecology of the pathogen, you might be able to go to other parts of the world. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in some of those areas. Um, Beruli ulcer is um, uh, caused by Mycobacterium ulcerans, which is an acid fast bacilli. It's extracellular in human tissue. In laboratory culture, it's aerophilic to microaerophilic uh, conditions is what it, it survives best in and grows in. It's highly sensitive to UV and it's very slow growing. So it takes two to six months to get to primary culture. Um, and it's very difficult to culture. And there's only been maybe two or three um, documented cases where they could um, culture mycobacterium ulcerans from the environment. Most of what we find from the environment is PCR based. And that PCR is based on the toxin that is produced by mycobacterium ulcerans and some other mycobacteria, which is called mycolactone. Mycolactone is a polyketide derived macrolide and it's immunosuppressive in the host and cytotoxic. And the genes that code for mycolactone are used uh, via PCR, quantitative PCR, to identify mycobacterium ulcerans in environmental samples. And so you can see here that the the molecules has a, has a core that doesn't change a whole lot, but the side chain itself allows us to identify different strains um, from Africa and Malaysia as, as one, one group. Um, ulcerans represented by mycolactone structures uh, are different in Australia compared to Asia and some mycobacterium marinum that actually have the plasmid that have been called Leflandii and Pseudoschatzii that are, that are found in the U.S. And, um, other parts of the world as well. So this might give us some indication of um, the importance of this molecule in different parts of the world, but also potentially how it evolved. And, and one big question is, why did it evolve? And so other groups have, gone, uh, have looked at the genomes and, and evaluated um, you know, where did ulcerins come from? And essentially it shared an ancestor with Mycobacterium marinum 
and has, has led to and gone through reductive evolution. And what our main interests are is how this diversity or how widespread is this diversity um, in certain habitats, both within and among countries. So we think it's gone through reductive evolution with niche adaptation that is, is likely somewhere stable. Um, and we think it emerged from a Marinum uh, congener. What was part of that uh, evolution was the acquisition of um, the MP, uh, MPM um, plasmid where mycolactone is expressed and made, expansion of some insertion sequences, acquisition of uh, bacteriophages, some pseudo genes that were formed and, and large deletions. Um, so the question is, why did this happen? Where did it happen? And what's the functional importance now? We know that certain um, marinum species have acquired the plasmid and are often fish pathogens or frog pathogens, sometimes human pathogens, that it's different from some of the pathogenesis and some of the genomic um, elements related to ulcerans proper. And so our collaborative group is really interested in how this happened and how widespread and how diverse are mycolactone producing mycobacteria, whether it's a marinum strain or an ulcerin strain, what's the evolution of these and potentially what's the diversity of those in ecosystems. Um, if you look at Brule ulcer and some of the, the studies that have been done to be able to predict um, you know, where MU is using PCR based, um, uh, methods. You find it's most common in stagnant habitats compared to lentic and lotic. That MU positivity in the environment actually predicts uh, BU incidence. And notice that there seems to be almost a threshold here in this paper um, indicating, you know, what, what triggers this? What triggers the MU positivity to, to jump? And then it leads to a certain number of cases, but that kind of follow, uh, falls off, right? And, and, and tapers off. And in 2005, we were thinking about this from a aquatic insect biomonitoring perspective. And what we were, we were thinking is, you know, you had these ecological disturbances and the hypothesis was, you know, the null would be that there, there is no increase in human infection with increasing disturbance. Maybe it was linear. Uh, maybe increased ecological disturbance led to higher human infection. It's likely nonlinear. And so the second hypothesis was, was there some uh, change in ecological or threshold of ecological disturbance that starts to be, uh, associate with increases in human incidence. And if we could identify that, could we have management or prevention opportunities from a landscape scale? And where aquatic insects came in and water qualities, a lot of aquatic insects are used for biomonitoring pro programs. And they essentially track that as, increase, as there's increases in ecological disturbance, there's changes in the aquatic taxa diversity. And we suspected that is, if we could use these as indicators, we would be able to identify that threshold of disturbance that would ultimately uh, lead to increased human infection. Now, why that is, is some of the questions we're asking now is what are the dynamics that are happening here? So the overall approach was landscape change affects the uh, population biology of mycobacterium ulcerans and other NPMs and aquatic habitats. If you look into those aquatic habitats, maybe we can determine whether or not uh, there's interactions with invertebrates and trophic chains, for instance, or tro trophic networks that allow for ulcerans to become more abundant in the habitat. And ultimately when uh, humans interact and go in and use those habitats, they somehow get exposed and transmission occurs. The general um, group of scientists studying um, Brule ulcer, I think that is part of this larger network where M ulcerans and biofilms and sediments and suspended water column. Um, and there's lots of evidence from that, and that humans get directly um, uh, inoculated, probably through a puncture, we think. There was a hypothesis with aquatic insects at one point, because there are predatory invertebrates known to bite humans. 
There's another likely trophic um, hypothesis where all serans is getting consumed in these biofilms by a variety of non-predatory invertebrates, then gets consumed by predators in the habitats. If it's a biting predator, maybe it um, becomes transmitted to humans that way. But then we do know that there's other fish there and amphibians that have been tested positive for all serans and other MPMs and how they may be dis disseminating uh, ulcerans and other MPMs in different habitats. And then in Australia, there's been a hypothesis that um, a larval mosquitoes acquire uh, mycobacterium ulcerans and the adults can then mechanically transmit it. And um, there's not a huge amount of evidence outside of Australia to support this, but I'll show you some data that, that we have uh, been acquiring over the last a couple of years. So we went in and early on and targeted and a lot of other groups have done this. They've measured water quality. They've done macrophyte sampling in a highly standardized way. Um, you, you collect invertebrates as well. You pick them either in the lab or uh, in the field. You do terrestrial invertebrate collections. You filter water. You get the biofilms from plants. You do soil collections. And then my colleague Heather Jordan came up with this brilliant idea of having chambers where you can put uh, slides that are coated uh, with auger and infused with mycolactone or not. And you can do more uh, kind of mechanistic uh, studies to understand how mycolactone might directly affect biofilms. And so we've been doing this and other groups have been doing this for several years. Um, you can see that lots of invert aquatic invertebrates have tested positive for MU. That's what this um, table that uh, current PhD student, Alex Bauer, She's putting together um, an overall lit review of this. It's in the environment. It's in invertebrates. It's, it's been found in amoeba. It's been found in biofilms. Um, and now what we're trying to understand is how it changes in those communities. And so Heather Jordan um, has done a lot of this work. We've been collaborating since this picture, I think, was taken in 2004, um, early on when she was a PhD student and I was a postdoc. Um, but more recently, um, she's been doing other profiling, so she can use VNTR profiling to look at the different types of mycobacterium ulcerans and other MPMs that are in the environment. And all I want to show you here is that there's, there's a lot of variability and there's a lot of strains there. She said she's not real proud of this gel. It's very thin. Um, but when you start looking at the molecular profiling using a variety of uh, really good targets, there's a lot of strains out there that we didn't know about. Uh, because we've been focused on human isolates for such a long time. But when you start going into the environment, it looks to be that there's a lot of diversity in myco, back, mycolactone producing mycobacteria. Um, and so that got us thinking, you know, why is there so much diversity? And is it important um, in terms of how people ultimately get Bruley ulcer? Um, so we worked with Dr. Jen Peckall, who's here at MSU as well, and we thought, okay, maybe the microbial communities are having an effect. And so with some, some preliminary data, some pilot money, um, we looked at bellostomatids, which is a biting water bug, and, and surfids, which are non-biting water bugs. And if you look at the microbial communities, what we see here is in blue, these were uh, uh, organisms that were tested positive for uh, mycobacterium ulcerans versus those that were negative. And even though the, the sampling size isn't huge, there are very distinct microbial communities between those insects that had mycobacterium ulcerans versus those that have not. And so what this might suggest, or at least um, give some indication is that maybe ulcerans interacts um, with other microbes, both within the host, but maybe also in biofilms in the environment in a way that changes the microbial communities or maybe the microbial community is already different and allows for mycobacterium ulcerans to invade that community of the host. So Heather has a PhD student and I'm gonna talk a little bit about her work, uh, Dr. Lakshmi uh, Jungle. And what they have been doing is putting these chamber slides that I described earlier into aquatic habitats and you can uh, put those in non-endemic aquatic habitats, meaning very low a previous indication of mycobacteria, uh, mycobacterium ulcerans in these habitats versus endemic, meaning uh, several years of highly positive and high quantitative PCR results in these habitats. 
And one, you can see that the microbial communities using high throughput sequencing are significantly different between endemic and non-endemic. And this is just looking at the tax of greater than 2% of the communities. So that's looking at that again, but if you use these slides and you put mycolactone into the auger versus controls in a rice field where there was an MU hotspot versus men's bathing area, which was low MU versus ladies bathing area, which was a MU hotspot. One, you get significant changes in their communities between the control slides and mycolactone slides, but it also depends on whether or not MU was highly abundant in those, in those habitats compared to those habitats that didn't have MU. So additional um, preliminary data to suggest that uh, mycobacterium ulcerans and mycolactin in particular has an effect on the microbial communities in some of these habitats. And then you can look at the alpha diversity um, versus mycolactin versus controls. And you chow one, there's a significant reduction in diversity when you have mycolactone in, into the auger of those slides. Um, Shannon diversity is, is also reduced, but not statistically, and still trying to understand the, the difference between these two in the calculations there. Um, the communities themselves, if you look at uh, the mycolactone or the increase and decrease from the mycolactone versus control, you get um, some that decrease and some that increase. And so that's our next step is to really start to target some of these that we find to consistently change when you add mycolactone in a variety of ha habitats. When Lakshmi and Heather um, did some one-on-one uh, -on -one experiments, meaning just re uh, evaluating how mycolactone affects Staphylococcus aureus in, in terms of the hemolytic activity, what they found was um, when you added mycolactone, there was significant changes um, in the hemolytic activity of uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. This was on, based on some other um, preliminary studies out of Heather's lab that looked at mycolactone as a quorum sensing molecule that uh, could be important to, to some of this work. And if you look at global gene expression um, and the number of genes that are changed per type of um, gene group, after 24 hours, almost consistently, there are significant uh, changes in certain genes. And this is out, outside of my expertise. But what I wanted to show you here is that there are gene changes and mycolactone seems to be responsible for some of those gene changes, at least in one species of bacteria. Some of our more recent work uh, with a PhD student in my lab, uh, where we've been working with some collaborators in Benin, um, basically looking at how mycolactone might affect insect behavior uh, mediated through microbial community changes. And so what Joe's been doing over the last few years is in a, in a field study in Benin, he put out containers that had mycolactone in them, 0.8 uh, micrograms per milliliter, mycolactone. And then he allowed for uh, mosquitoes to naturally uh, oviposit or lay eggs. And, and what he found was there was a significant reduction in oviposition um, when you treated the leaf leachate containers with mycolactone. Shannon diversity significantly increased when you um, added 0.8 micrograms a milliliter of mycolactone. The communities in mycolactone treated uh, containers for oviposition, which is leaf, late, leaf leachate, the leaf um, leachate microbiomes were very different, significantly different, and there were specific targeted attacks of that either increased or decreased with mycolactone addition. Um, we weren't satisfied with that. It was a field study, which for a field study indicated uh, some perhaps some good effect sizes, but uh, Joe was really interested in doing more of a dose response in the lab. So he repeated some of this work in the lab here in Michigan, but um, went from 0.05 to 0.8, and then looked at the number of eggs that were oviposited by mosquitoes versus the control and found the significant dose response uh, related to that. So what this indicates is mycolactone has some effect, we think, on the microbial communities and that the, uh, the microbial change in microbial communities likely affects the cues, the volatile organic compounds that are being emitted from uh, microhabitats of decomposing uh, leaf leachates. And that then affects how, um, at least in this case, mosquitoes respond to oviposition. 
So it gets back to that complex network of organisms in these aquatic habitats and um, maybe how those biofilms change with abiotic conditions and certain invertebrates, whether they're grazers or potentially scavengers. And then you look at some of the data that comes up at how microbial communities are different related to mycobacterium ulcerans or mycolactone, how mycolactone might affect um, community structure of those types of microbial communities that are in situ, in situ and then potentially how it affects um, behavior of invertebrates, whether that's through preferential feeding or overposition. So all this work collectively with other groups um, in the literature, but also what we've been discovering was through some of our collaborative uh, pilot data, uh, all serines and other NPMs might probably require stable habitat based on the genome, a protective habitat. Mycolactone seems to be important for survival from laboratory studies and genomic studies. Um, is it just another environmental bacteria that's opportunistic of humans? And then what about these other mycolactone producing organisms? And so um, is ulcerans or NPMs, are they parasites, are they symbionts, or they have commensal relationships with some of the other uh, organisms in these habitats? And so that gets me to the last part of the talk that um, has arisen from all of, all of this data, from the literature, from new collaborations with Christine and Jean-Francois on exploring how uh, mycolactone may have evolved as a, as a weapon. I'm starting to reconsider the weapon idea, but as a, as a novel trait for its ability to um, colonize and persist and ultimately disperse in um, aquatic habitats. This is the, the team. There's a, a large multinational team of, uh, of collaborators from Mississippi State, MSU, University of West Alabama. There's our, our team there doing some, some work where ulcerans has been found in the US. And then Jean-Francois Cagon and Christine Chauvelin. Um, I wish I could be there working with everyone in Montpellier um, right now to further this collaborative work. And in this, what we're, we're testing is how the, the mycolactone may have initially evolved and is, is now used as a novel weapon or trait that has a function to be able to enter new microbial communities, become established and persist, or maybe get dispersed through certain hosts, fish hosts, amphibian hosts. Um, and then what conditions lead to high abundances of ulcerans and other NPMs in the environment? What are the, the thresholds, right? Um, what are those interactions that allow for ulcerans and these others to become much more abundant in habitats? And then what kind of interaction do you need with humans to uh, allow for transmission? And so we're doing this from uh, along uh, three, three different scales from, and that, that are both space and time. So from short temporal scales to long temporal scales, using some of the chamber slides that uh, Heather Jordan has put together, looking at mechanisms at micro, uh, micrometers to meters, hours to month about the mycolactone activity and when it's expressed and how much is expressed among different MPMs. Then if that expression and occurrence occurs and does it change with more complex communities of invertebrates or plant exudates or the biofilms on plants and maybe other um, eukaryotic microorganisms like amoeba or protists. And then ultimately um, how certain uh, vertebrate hosts may have played a role in its evolutionary history and biogeography um, of these NPMs and how diverse are they and how common um, are they as well. So we've wanted to do this over three years in French Guiana and three major watersheds. Um, and we're gonna interrogate water, soil, macrophytes, aquatic invertebrates, fishes, um, a whole slew of genomic approaches. Um, we're gonna uh, do SNP typing, uh, microbacterium plasmid diversity, virulence detection, microbial uh, community assessments, targeted enriched um, assays for mycobacteria, along with qPCR uh, Sanger sequencing as well for mycolactone expression and doing some metatranscriptomics as well. And doing some mechanisms with the chambers and some other small scale manipulative experiments in the field. We were supposed to go last March, that has been delayed. Another significant field mission was planned in July that has also been delayed. Um, and so we have not been able to 
um, capitalize on the two and a half million dollar grant that was uh, is supporting this. Um, however, we have been uh, active in, in trying to really interrogate the literature um, on NPMs and developing a website. So if you have more interest, you can follow us um, on Instagram, you can follow us on Twitter, and we have a series of videos that gives the background to our project that is on a YouTube channel um, that you can follow. Uh, just Google EvoPath Amazonia for um, any of these to, to get a little bit more background on, on all of that. So I wanna thank you for your attention today um, in the midst of the, the COVID pandemic. I know it's a struggle for many of us um, to move forward. Um, so I wanna also, you know, and especially in our election right now, um, gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. And I'm hoping that the current uh, situation kind of follows this and we learn from what's happened in our recent past as well. This is uh, supported by NSF. Several of our collaborative organizations contribute uh, in, in a variety of ways for the funding. And so I want to thank you and be happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a, uh, so we have a um, uh, we have two questions coming from the first one from, from uh, Christine Payard. So you, if you want, Christine, I can open your microphone and then you can ask it if it's okay for you. Okay. Wait, can you hear me? wait, 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 wait. Christine Payard, voila. Yes, so you can, so you can, uh, yep, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting mark, huh? the very large presentation. And, and I have a question because me, I work more in marine fish. So I have a question. What about the transmission of tuberculosis by mycobacterium to marine fish? Is it, how is it transmitted if there is transmission with uh, habitat change by birds, insect? And I wanted to know if it's due to uh, uh, population of Mycobacterium ulcerans or a mix of Mycobacterium marinum ulcerans and some different clones? <laughs> oh what? yeah, um, that, that, that's, a, that's a really good question that um, my collaborator at Western uh, Alabama would be better to, to answer that, but I don't think anyone really knows, um, to be honest. And part of what we want to, ex to explore and test with this new funding is exactly that, is how often does it occur, which MPMs um, might be interacting with ulcerans or, uh, or other mycobacteria and marinum and how that's interacting with ulcerans um, to infect certain fish. And then why do certain fish be, uh, become infected and actually present disease? And, and that we have some questions related to the microbiome of the mucosal communities, or the mu mucosum of certain uh, fish species. But I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Um, Mike might know more about that, but I don't think so. I don't think we, we know actually how it gets transmitted, much like we don't really have a concrete answer for how ulcerans be becomes transmitted and causes pathogenesis. We know how it causes pathogenesis, how it gets into and has a, an effective dose to cause ulcers in humans. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think uh, your research will be more developed on this aspect uh, next time we can speak. <laughs> thank you very I, much. I was hoping to have more data related to our March mission and our July mission, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, that didn't happen. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Then there is a question coming from uh, Remy, Remy Froissart. So if you want to, to, to ask aloud, please. Remy, are you there? Yes. Okay. I'm here. Good. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So my question was quite simple. Did you sequence the bacteria and do you have any idea if the mycolactone gene belongs to any genetic mobile element, such as, uh, for instance, bacteriophages, which would allow a kind of uh, horizontal gene transfer very easily? 
Um, actually, we were just talking about that yesterday in our, in our weekly meeting. Um, all, all of the genomes come primarily from human isolates. And my understanding is that we don't either don't know or we, or we it's been ruled out that the, it's, it's hitching a ride on any transposable element. Um, and that's actually a, 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 a broader question that I think a lot of people have at this point is how is it getting transmitted or, or potentially moved from one, one clone to the next or one strain to the next? Um, my, and maybe Christine would know better, but I don't think um, anyone really yeah. knows. Uh, oh, my screen is frozen. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, maybe you hear me now? Yes, yes, it's fine. I don't have. Okay. Yeah, it's born on a, on a plasmid. And uh, in some genotypes, uh, the same plasmid seems to be also... Uh, interacting with uh, recombination and sexual transmission, some transduction, in fact. So, but it's really poorly known. So it's a plasmid. It should have some horizontal transmission. Seems to be uh, a bit uh, not so probable. But in fact, we, as Eric said, most of the isolates that have been sequenced so far are, are just uh, really biased on uh, human skin. And the, the big question we have right now, so we are trying to work on this on the probability of horizontal versus vertical uh, transmission uh, of the, the plasmic cutting, the, the doxing. But really, uh, in fact, we only know the very tip of the iceberg. We don't know the environmental diversity, and this is a big part of our project to to know what you have on a human skin, a, what is the percentage of what's going on outside. And I and if I remember right, the the plasmid is pretty large, and so that's been the rationale that people don't, really don't think it's it's being moved horizontally with the plasmid, but. No one has directly tested that, I, I don't think. Uh, what we know is that in, in optimal culture, uh, the plasmid can be unexpressed or it can lose the plasmid. And so the mycolactone also. Yeah, but, uh, and so it's not, it's not uh, really necess necessary for for living when you have no competitors <laughs> and when you have food. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so then maybe, well, if uh, any other question, then please either raise your hands um, in the, um, Raise your hands in the in the question and answer or in the or write it by the in, in the chat. I will have one 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 question there also partially partly related to this presence of the of the cluster of, of enzymes uh, um, synthesizing the mycolactone in this plasmid. Um, um, the question is that you have said that there are modifications of this lateral chain of the microlide the, uh, that they seem to also be related with a geographical distribution of the isolates. Do you have any evidence of whether these uh, modifications, biochemical modifications in the side chain of the microlide, of the mycolactone, have an impact on the clinical presentation of the infection? Uh, and do you know with also whether these modifications are also in, uh, brought on by enzymes that are present on the plasmid? What was that last part? I'm sorry. Whether, whether the enzymes that are responsible of these modifications yeah. are also present on the plasmid and so that they are susceptible of being gained and lost. Um, I don't know the answer to your, your second question. Um, however, the different forms of mycolactone do present with di different degrees of virulence in, in, human, in human cases, meaning uh, the, the forms in uh, Australia uh, in Africa are, are much more vir virulent than those in Australia, for instance, in Asia. Um, 
in, I mean, in, in South America. So mycolecta, the, the different forms do have different degrees of activity once in the human host. Whether or not the, there's an environmental component to, to that differential effects, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Uh, in terms of your second question, uh, that's where it gets a little bit too uh, molecular biology for me. Um, and I rely on my, my collaborators, but I don't think we know to be honest, if it's if there's enzymes there, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So if uh, um, any, so if there's any more questions then coming from, from the rest of the attendees, then please raise your hands. And then if not, it's, it's, I think it is five already in, in Montpellier, and I don't know what time is it in, in, in Michigan. 11. Um, Mm, okay. <laughs> Good. Then, then thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the for the presentation. That, that's extremely interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Christine, for for bringing um, Eric to the to the seminars. And then, uh, so next week on Friday we will meet uh, again at European time, so eleven thirty, with a presentation by Denis Ross. Okay, so uh, thank you very much again, um, uh, Eric, and thanks, Christine, and good afternoon to everybody. Okay, thank you, and enjoy your yeah. evening. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Yeah.